Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. This country's founders were deists. They had a strong faith in God and they were the heroes of their age. And today, those with a strong faith in God appear to be the enemy of the state. I urge you to rest in the Lord and thank Him for the liberty that yet remains for you to fellowship together uh, in the study of His Word. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we stand in Your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, so very thankful for the privilege and the opportunity that You've given us. The opportunity that's ours to worship You and to feast together on Your Word. As we approach Your Word, we realize how little we know and how immense You are. It is our great desire that the Holy Spirit be our only teacher, that He would filter out the foolishness and the ignorance, but seal to our hearts that which is truth, so that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. We're studying together in the Epistle to the Galatians, verse by verse, and in our last study together, we were in the area of verse 16 of chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 16. We looked at how Paul has presented, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, his credentials as an apostle, that he had, in fact, seen the Lord Jesus Christ after his resurrection that he had received a special revelation from the Lord after Christ's resurrection from the dead. He then is led by the Holy Spirit to recount the trip that he made to Jerusalem to present before the, the council there at Jerusalem the gospel that he preached in Antioch. Uh, for there had been certain people that had uh, snuck in unaware uh, certain people suggesting that preaching the grace and, and the faith in Christ wasn't enough, that it had to be added to with something like circumcision at that time. He met then with the leaders at the church in Jerusalem. They uh, agreed totally with him. That they added nothing to that which he preached. They recognized his apostleship to the Gentiles. And they recognized Peter's apostleship to the Jew. And I pointed out to you that as we went through those verses that Peter was not preaching a different gospel than Paul. He was preaching exactly the same gospel. The Holy Spirit then leads Paul to recount an encounter that he had with Peter in Antioch where Peter was openly fellowshipping with the Gentile Christians. And then certain Christians came down from Jerusalem and he was afraid of them. So he separated from them and he wouldn't any longer fellowship with the Gentiles. And the point I tried to make as we looked at that was that it was, it was not a doctrinal separation. It was Peter's fear of criticism. That's why he separated, and that's why many Christians today actually trample the truth of the gospel. And Paul saw that it was wrong, and he confronts Peter. He confronts him to the face, and he does it publicly. Don't be like Peter, who was afraid of criticism from legalists for hanging out with those who weren't. He said to Peter, before them all, you know, and, and you could say, well, that wasn't very loving. You know, it could have been done in private. He could have approached him in private, could have said, you know, Peter, we, we got to talk about this. But, but you see, Peter's action was public. And so Paul had every right, in fact, should have confronted Peter in public, that he wasn't walking uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. 
It was the truth of the Gospel that was in question, that which the Holy Spirit guards so zealously, and we trample on it today. And so Paul is led by the Holy Spirit to say, Peter, we're not sinners of the Gentiles. That's what the Jew called the Gentiles. Sinner. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. You know, the argument goes like, you know, law can't work, therefore it can't be works of law. It must be works in law. And if it's works in law, then it must be faith in Christ. And we now have the popular preaching that we are justified, that is, we are made righteous by our personal faith in Jesus Christ. And folks, that puts the thing backwards. First of all, there is no word in, uh, epsilon nu in the original Greek of verse 16. What you have are the words ek, out of or, or out from law. We are justified by the obedience of Jesus Christ. It's very clear in Romans 5.19, for by the disobedience of the one, Adam, the many, that's God's people, were made sinners. So the same group, in, in the same manner, the same group was made righteous by the obedience of Christ. They weren't made righteous by their faith in Christ. They were made righteous by the obedience of Christ. The faithfulness of Christ, it's a genitive. And that's what Galatians 2.16 is repeating. We know that a man is not made righteous by works of law. It's not works of the law. The word does not there. It's not articulated. There is no word the, but by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Both are genitives. We are not justified by law's works, but by Christ's faithfulness. That's what the text is saying. Now, what I'm going to say contradicts almost all of today's preaching. If you, if you have a modern translation like the New, New American Standard, it would say faith in Christ, not faith of Christ. Now, folks, I don't care which translation you use. Every translation is to some degree influenced by the convictions of the translators. That's impossible to avoid. So I don't care which translation you use, as long as you use a translation. Don't call something like the, the Living Bible a translation. It might be easy to read, but it's really worthless for Bible study. So I don't care what translation you choose. All the modern ones, you know, if you have the NIV, uh, if you have the the, the NAS, the New American Standard, they translated it faith in Christ. And the argument is essentially based upon the evangelistic idea that we are made righteous by placing our personal faith in Jesus Christ. I believe that the biblical position is we place our faith in Jesus Christ because He redeemed us and made us righteous. And he did that because he's faithful. He's the faithful one. All right? The clear biblical teaching is that if you are not his sheep, you can't believe. Why do you not believe? Because you are not my sheep. If you were my sheep, you would hear my words. So the basis of hearing and accepting and believing is that you be his sheep. Okay? And so it's the faithfulness of Christ. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by the works of law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. We too have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. Now if I turn back to Romans chapter 3, verse 21, but now apart from law, God's righteousness is revealed and is attested by the law and the prophets. God's righteousness by means of the faith of Jesus Christ. 
I'm suggesting to you that Galatians 2.16 teaches you and me that our justification, our righteousness is based upon the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. That's what I'm trying, that's what I'm, that's what I'm going to say. Now, I believe almost all modern Christians who are faithful to the Word of God would agree with that. Uh, that there is an intimate connection between your personal faith in Christ and the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. In fact, I believe any serious Bible scholar would at least admit that your faith in Christ is based upon the faithfulness of, of Jesus Christ. The problem is, it seems difficult for the human mind to abandon just what these Judaizers were, were trying to teach. You know, you've got to add something to that faithfulness of Christ. And in your case, it's your faith in Christ. I mean, why not add circumcision? Why not add baptism? Why not add church membership? Uh, why not add tithing? I mean, you pick it. You pick it. If, if you being made righteous is a compound equation that depends upon your faith in Christ and the faithfulness of Christ, you don't have a chance. You don't have a chance. Because why? The natural mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God. It cannot please God. Those who are in the flesh cannot hear the words of God, cannot come to Christ. All of these are scriptural truths. They're not ideas I made up. The only mind that can come to Christ, the only will that can accept Christ is one that has been made righteous ahead of time by Christ. And that's, that, folks, is the grand truth of this passage. It isn't anything we do. It's because of the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. The, the immediate cry of, of so many people is, well, that's unfair. That doesn't give people a chance who haven't heard the Word. You know, your way, Steve, doesn't give them a chance. You know, if they have to accept uh, Jesus Christ in order to go to heaven, then well, they don't have a chance unless they hear. But if, but if they have been made righteous by the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ, then there will be some from every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue. What a marvelous truth of the Word of God. Verse 17. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is Christ therefore the minister of sin? May it never be. It's not God forbid. That's an English translation 400 years ago. It's a first class condition. If as is the case, because this is what we do. We, do. We, we seek to be justified in Christ. The word by there is, is in, in the sphere of Christ. It's a dative. And so if we seek to be justified in the sphere of Christ, we ourselves are found sinners. That's the case under law. You kept the law. The revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that He came to call sinners to repentance. Now, dearly beloved, listen. It, he came to call sinners to repentance. So if you're not a sinner, you don't have a chance. I mean, the fundamental truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ is if you are not a sinner, you've had it. Because He didn't come to call the righteous, but He came to call sinners to repentance. So the first thing that we see in the Gospel of Jesus Christ is that we are sinners. That we are without hope before God. That we are totally depraved. Totally depraved. The depraved person cannot come to God. The depraved person cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. The depraved person cannot hear the Word of God. He cannot receive spiritual truth. He cannot cease sinning. The imperatives, the constraints of total depravity are almost ignored today completely. 
he is absolutely, absolutely unable to help himself. And by the grace of God, that sinner was made righteous because why? Because Christ died in his place. That's what verse 17 says. If we're justified by Christ, we're found to be sinners. Well, if we're not sinners, there's no need to be made righteous. If we're going to be made righteous by Jesus Christ, we have to start as a sinner. Now, does that make Christ the minister or the servant of sin? Well, of course not. If I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. That's also a first-class condition. And it's true, if he builds again, that is present tense, if he's in the process of building again, the things which I destroyed, and the word destroyed there means to make invalid. If I build again those things which I made invalid, which is law, then I make myself a transgressor because I broke the law by going to Christ. I, I've had it either way. If I eat with the Gentiles, that's breaking the law. If I don't eat with the Gentiles, that's against the truth of the gospel. Either way, what you have to do is make the law invalid. If the law is still valid, then you can't eat with the Gentiles. If the truth of the gospel is valid, You can't eat with a Gentile. And, and what you did in the truth of the gospel is set loose the law. You made invalid the law. Now, if you make it valid again, you're a transgressor. And that's what Peter was doing. That's what Peter was doing. When he ate with the Gentiles, he said that the law was invalid. When he refused to eat with the Gentiles, he, he said the law was valid. You know, it's interesting that the Holy Spirit actually leaves Paul, Peter's name out of it because that's exactly what Peter was doing. The Lord had great fondness for Peter. He cut loose from the law when he ate with the Gentiles. When he refused to eat with the Gentiles, he tied himself back up to the law and he was in that quandary of verse 18. And Paul goes on then to say, for I, by means of the law, am dead, dead to the law. Now, it isn't that Jesus Christ destroyed the law. His very testimony is that He didn't come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill it. All right? That's the grand truth. He, he fulfilled it. The 19th verse. The marvelous truth is our identification with Christ. It's something I've talked about on numerous occasions. Grand, grand truth. One of the things the Scriptures teach us is our identification with Christ in His death, burial, and resurrection. And that's the basic meaning of the word baptism. To come under the influence of or to be identified with. I think that is one of the most fabulous passages of Scripture. I hate to put one above another, but one concept above another, but our identification is fabulous. Paul was made blind on the road to Damascus. The Lord appeared to Ananias, told him that he was going to send Saul to him. And Ananias said, well, you're making a big mistake. And, and God, you know, God, uh, uh, well, you know, you don't, apparently you don't know who he is. And God told him to basically shut up. And the Holy Spirit said to Paul through the prophet, two things are going to happen to you. Two things. You're going to receive your sight and you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're following the math, two things are going to happen. You're going to receive your sight. You're going to receive the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 9 tells us Paul stood up, received his sight, was baptized, now it says two things are going to happen to him, and it says two things happen. And clearly the language would uh, lead us to believe that receiving the Holy Spirit was his identification with Christ. 
And that's what the word baptizo meant uh, in the next verse. He received his sight and he was baptized into Christ, identified with Christ. Whether he was water baptized or not is up to you. I, personally, I don't happen to think that he was. I don't think the man had a bathtub or a pot of water or anything else in, in his house. When Paul was talking to him, he received his sight and he was baptized. He received the Holy Spirit. He was identified with Christ. This is a spiritual baptism. Now that identification with Christ, we read about it in Romans chapter 6. Well, we actually read about it in other places too, but uh, we were on the cross with Christ because it says we died with Him. Now, one of the ways around that is to say, well, that's, that's some kind of a, a mystic language that says in some mysterious way Christ's death was applied to you whenever, when, when you believed. Now, I guess I'm asked to believe that when Christ died on the cross, He really didn't know who He was dying for. That's, that's a kind of a sad way to die. If first of all he died for every single person, well then he sure was defeated because that didn't work. Folks, we're dealing with God's Word. God's Word says no matter how you take it, that you died with Christ, that you were buried with Christ, that you were raised with Christ. That identification is fantastic. He knew you before the foundation of the world. He works in you both the will and the do of His good pleasure. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that most of us would rather you work in us both the will and do of our good pleasure, but it's not what He does. If, and if you don't believe that, you don't have a very peaceful life. It doesn't matter whether you're sick or, or well, rich or poor, doesn't matter whether someone else is rich and you're not, who cares? I, you know, you're not here very long and God Almighty is working you to do that which is best for you. You ought to somehow grasp God's identifying you with Christ. Your name was there when He died. On the cross, you were buried with Him. Your sins were removed as far as the east is from the west. Buried in the de depths of the sea, the deepest sea, sought for, not found, remembered no more, forgiven, washed white as snow. You stand before Him without spot, without blemish. I want you to know that peace, folks. I, really, I truly do. And, and in, invariably, it doesn't matter where I travel. If we talk about these things... Oh, oh, you don't know how I live. You don't, know, you don't know the sins I commit. Folks, your new creation doesn't sin. It's the old creation that sins. That's all it does. Don't be surprised that it does that because that's all it does. Should that then remove your peace and, and rest and joy? No, no. Simon, Simon, who do you think loves me the most? And I can almost see Simon frowning because he doesn't want to answer. I suppose it's the one to whom the most was forgiven. Dearly beloved, I know that my Redeemer lives, that in spite of the sin that dogs my footsteps, I am His and His forever. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for Your Word, for the privilege and the opportunity that we have to feast upon it and rest in it. May its grand truth grip our hearts and change our lives that we might go rejoicing through this veil of tears to see our Redeemer face to face in glory. For it's in His name we pray. Amen. I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Thanks for watching.